Okay, okay, so we are live. Hello again, everybody. Uh, today's third lecture with Thomas Mikal. Thomas Mikal is a professor, Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand, Jin Hall Global University, India. Uh, Thomas Mikal has been teaching and researching globally on modern and hypermodern theories of architecture and urbanism over a long career in the diverse international architectural programs. He has an MR from Harvard GSD on sci-fi urbanism and PhD from Georgia Tech in architectural theory, philosophy and art history. First lecture was two weeks ago and was about Bauhaus Futurism and Dystopian Architecture. Uh, second one was uh, last week and was about multiple ecologies. And this week's uh, topic will be ultra thin surfaces and uh, hope you like it. I'll give the mic to Thomas and uh, have a nice time. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, happy to join you guys again for another talk. And uh, today we're gonna look at uh, something around the idea of skins and surfaces and uh, both some uh, technologies as well as some uh, concepts and also some examples from contemporary architecture to think about how the, uh, the world looks the way it does. So I wanna start off talking about something very close to the body, the skin, and particularly the idea of the skin as both an organ of the body as a surface, but also as a sensory data collector. We can think of the uh, obvious uh, development that happens as small children. Uh, we will start to experience the world through our skin through our reception, but our skin in particular is how we interact with the environment. And the skin is also a place that um, is full of wonder in and of itself. <clears throat> the individuality of our fingerprints talks about the deeper individuality encoded of the uh, obvious in the DNA that is both filled with uh, uh, hard data, but also uh, optimizes us in a certain way to explore and make sense of the world. And the skin is one of the more sophisticated uh, sense organs that we have in terms of its ability to touch and to reach across distances. One consequence of this um, that shows up in the philosophy of uh, Merleau-Ponty and others is the idea of uh, crossing, that the skin itself starts to anticipate through touch, through sensation, the textures of the world. And in this process of doing this, because of its hypersensitivity, particularly areas around say the mouth and the fingertips, we are in many ways um, uh, developed to explore the world through the skin. The skin itself gives us not just a sensation or set of sensations about the world, but it becomes kind of an interactive media form with the world. Our fingerprints are left everywhere, both in terms of our literal fingerprints touching the world as we move through it, but also in a much more metaphorical sense, our fingerprints of how we interact with the world. We leave fingerprints in nature and our environment. We leave fingerprints in the writing that we do and the designing that we do as well. The Merleau-Ponty conception is actually quite sophisticated in terms of how we seek to cross and this idea of crossing is something that happens to us perceptually. The perceptual apparatus of the skin is a very sophisticated mechanism, as I have said. The skin or the flesh is capable of great performance, great endurance, and is highly versatile. It is also a very significant membrane in terms of retaining and keeping certain elements in and other elements porously moving through it. Uh, we can think of it neither as a solid nor a liquid, but something that is both. It is also the sort of uh, uh, organ that we naturalize to the point that we don't think of it as part of our, our sensory systems, or we don't think of it as, as an organ in and of itself. It just becomes part of us. In the idea of the space of exploration or adventure, the small child as they move and navigate through space, you can understand it conceptually and perceptually, for example, in Paget's studies, but you can also think of it in terms of phenomenological approach of the touching as a form of discovery, as an introduction. The crossing from the boundary of our body, which is the skin, into the spaces we inhabit and the environments that we uh, occupy, themselves are composed of surfaces. Between myself as a body and the walls of the room as a different surface, there is a gap, a space. But this is a space that we fill with our activities, with our intentionality, with functional spaces and architecture, with the oxygen we need to breathe. And we cross that distance, first optically, but also haptically, through our sense of touch. We start to anticipate the feel of the different surfaces. We start to anticipate how they might also react to our fingerprints. And in that process, the space between us and the other surfaces of the world ceases to be uh, um, different and they start to be composed or conceived of as the same flesh. 
for this reason, Merleau-Ponty described it uh, very precisely as the crossing, this chiasmic distance that we seek to cross with our eyes and with our hands through the optics and the haptics. So that what is outside of us, what is different, still becomes a surface that produces sense, both sensation as well as logical sense. So for us, the epidermis is a highly effective organ within a highly uh, curious organism, but it also binds us in a certain way to the other surfaces of the earth through interaction. The composition of the skin is also of significance because it is not uniform. It is in no ways a homogenous material. It is, you could think of it as layers, as different components that um, operate in and through each other. Here in this drawing, which I appreciate the way that it's drawn, almost this uh, translucent uh, terrarium type quality filled with fascinating organisms, plants and animals. This illustration from a textbook shows you how within the skin itself, we can see the multiple layers, the epidermis, which has a function to contain, uh, but also as a surfacing, um, it responds and reacts to the structures beneath it. The dermis, which is filled with many, many microecologies and organisms that um, are uh, some a part of the uh, body's biology. Uh, and then the deeper layer is the hypodermis. You see, for example, all of the different glands that interact, the nerve endings, which are in many ways the linkage between skin and sensation and cognition, but also everything from blood and lymph moving through it. This is a systematic study of the infothin layer layers of the skin and this process of the layers themselves having very different tissue densities performing very different ways. It's a very explicit metaphor for the way of thinking about how surfaces work too. Every surface has beneath it another surface and each surface that we consider that might be homogenous has an inner face and an outer face as well. So we can see not just the outer surface that faces the world that absorbs things that responds to pressure, touch, temperature. Also it, it's Sweats, it radiates heat, it produces different chemicals that others can, can sense. And in this way, we can also think of the skin as a type of communication or type of media, as well as being a sense or data collector too. All of this happens without numbers, but through electrochemical signals and invisible biological processes, some of which are controlled by the lizard brain, all of them operating in a, a very networked situation inside the body. The skin needs a network inside and it needs variables and potentially randomness or noise conditions on the outside to make sense of the world. Consider a different type of skin, the octopus. The octopus has a skin who also, who's also perform the same sort of functions, but it's got a superpower that's quite fascinating. The octopus itself is a very different organism. Not only is it submerged and in many ways touching the ocean all of the time, the octopus also has a very different cognition system. In humans, most of the nerve endings will uh, travel and send signals immediately to the brain. The octopus has a decentralized hierarchy. There are some uh, control centers in the head, but each of the eight tentacle arms has their own nervous system, almost their smaller mini computing brain. And this means that in an octopus, uh, all eight tentacles will have different attitudes and postures towards the world. In an octopus, one of the tentacles can be clumsy, one can be swift, one can be aggressive, one can be playful. <clears throat> they each respond to the world <clears throat> slightly differently as, as sense organs, uh, but also as propulsion systems. One of the fascinating things about the octopus that people have noticed is how it can actually respond instantly to changes in environment. Not only can it mimic the materials or the color patterns of the surfaces that it's touching, it can recall those too. So what happens is a fascinating process where the octopus, when it selects to do so, will make itself invisible. An octopus can actually sit on top of two different surfaces and match both colors almost instantly. This chameleon-like ability to use very simple sense receptors, very simple uh, chemical control systems, and to do it in a pre-reflexive way is a fascinating study of some of the performativity we might find in different skins and surfaces of the world. If we know to look for it, we can find these other biological uh, processes and other cognitive processes, and we can begin to translate those into potential spatial, environmental, and surface theories as well. So this is the idea of maybe thinking about biomimicry or technology transfer from the organic to the inorganic as a perhaps overriding ambition that we can find in uh, eco-design and post-human strategies. <clears throat> 
the skin of the octopus is high performing for its environment, as is ours. And the skin situates the octopus in the environment and also shapes and forms that environment as well. It is highly interactive and highly customized to its location. At a very fine scale, we find something surprising, a repeating but non-regular pattern of different types of cells that in different combinations can produce the entire range of colors. These are a highly evolved sense uh, or sensation system, but also responsive system. You can think of it as type of pixelation done organically. And this is a pattern that can be found in other organic systems as well. But the geometries of this are not as interesting as the overall responsiveness of the system. It is the possibility of an infinite variation from very fixed numbers of data points. We can also think of it in terms of the ability to communicate that this kind of uh, flash mimicry is also a type of signaling, a type of of encoding the octopus to be subordinate or invisible to camouflage within an environment, to let the environment be the signal and the octopus to disappear, minimize its presence as noise, if we follow data theory. If we look at the way that the skin works in relationship to the nervous system, um, you can find examples online of the uh, sensory homunculus. Um, and uh, this is a mapping across the uh, brain of the, um, where the locations of the, the uh, signal from the different parts of the body transfer. So inside your brain as a piece of wetware, as an organic computer, um, there are the, uh, the ends of the wires lead to these areas. Um, this is a bit of an exaggeration. I, each of the, uh, uh, per, uh, uh, the geometries of the folds of the brain map exactly, but this is roughly where um, all of the different sensory organs go. The human body, if you look at it, most of the sensations coming to the brain will be either through the eye, through the mouth and the tongue, through the hands. There's a higher density of nerve endings per square inch in these areas of the body than almost everywhere else. The sensitivity that comes from certain areas like the feet or under the armpits or on the belly when you're tickling little kids, for example, um, or uh, playing around. Certain people have tickle spots, but for all intents and purposes, the density of the nerve endings varies significantly through the body and responds to very different types of pressures and sensations too. If you've ever felt an insect crawling across your, your neck, uh, you notice how hypersensitive you are to that or across your face compared to say uh, one crawling across your leg, which you would notice much less regularly. So the entire body has itself evolved in this way to have differentiated densities of nerve endings. That is to say, selectively prioritize different <laughs> sensations that come through the skin. And this is potentially an advantage. As we know that the skin itself has different layers and has depth to it, even something simple as having a tattoo um, requires some deeper knowledge of the layers of the, the epidermis and the dermis. The location of the ink and its density, uh, the permanence of it, all of these attest to a fundamental knowledge of the skin as a depth model of sensation. The pain that comes with it, and the potential um, after effects of the tattoo uh, can last a long time. But we also can think about the fact that in tattooing as one sort of, uh, not camouflage, but going the other way as one sort of uh, uh, explicit uh, iconography, uh, in doing that and breaking from the, uh, the pattern and seeking to impose a new geometry, the layer in the depth of the ink is highly uh, dependent on not just the body, but also the chemistry involved too. And these will obviously shift and change slightly over time as the, as the tattoos blur over the decades. But what is also interesting in this process, I think, if we think about architecture and design, is that ability to operate not just at the surface of surfaces, but to think about surface itself having a depth. That's something that we consider to be superficial or something that we consider to be uh, perceptual um, is actually itself composed of layers. And if we can understand this, this means that we can work with surfaces and conceive of design, modify, and adjust surfaces of the world in multiple ways, not simply at the top or the outward facing layer. We can also think about the transitive quality of attributes, the traits and characteristics, the adjectives you might say about the things in the world. Two visual playthings to consider here in address design, the technology of media and the pixelated uh, uh, screen condition is 
woven into the fabric using a different sort of uh, electrical circuitry to create the dress that is both screen as well as clothing. These sorts of electromechanical hybrids um, anticipate a future environment where every skin potentially has data, has a smartness to it, or in some ways is responding to the invisible fields of everything from uh, internet to electromagnetism as a type of uh, camouflage or as a type of plumage. You can think of the possibility of buildings themselves already having skins that are pixels and not bricks or pixels on bricks or pixels in bricks. Uh, for example, in the material Litricon, where different light emitting uh, chemicals and light emitting uh, devices are inserted into the surface or beneath the surface to change and modify it. The depth of the surface, the intensity of the image, the ability for it to shift and respond and change, the possibility of it being reactive or reflexive to the environment, Imagine filling out uh, or having your personal data transcribed into the color like a mood ring or something that uh, maps, for example, one of your one of the personality types, which dictates a pattern. And when you recognize people at the nightclub, they have the same pattern. You know you have the same uh, sort of, uh, I guess, data or metrics. Um, this possibility of a visualized future is something that our skin already does in terms of sense and touch, as well as our eyes. But this is appealing to the possibility of this trans of attributes from one technology to another and as a way of thinking about adding a, a level of data um, manipulation or augmentation to the material surfaces of the world. Um, <clears throat> the Korean photographer on the right, uh, June, has uh, done some very playful work in photography of transposing the uh, elegant brittleness of ceramics and the elegant brittleness of the human flesh in these photo collages. You also notice if you look very closely, a critique of uh, consum consumer culture in the actual uh, logos that brand and tattoo the ceramic body in this image. This is also a different type of transience where the, the visual field or the surface conditions from one scale or one form of object or one form of media can be reinserted or reinscribed on other bodies and other surfaces. This transience, I call it, is a type of transitive materiality where it's not grafting one material onto another, but grafting the attributes of one material onto another as a very powerful tool of technology transfer or modification at the surface. I want to talk about the world in terms of thin surfaces. And one of the terms that I, I like to use about this is the ultra thin as a way of thinking about the, I guess, what is the thinnest surface you need to, to actually accomplish some performance criteria. And the um, way to think about it in the most literal sense, if you think of flashing, right? Flashing is a type of uh, very thin metal used in architecture primarily for guiding rainwater. Flashing, as you can see here, would be inserted along uh, any place, for example, in a uh, flat roof with a canopy or a parapet um, to prevent water from penetrating penetrating that very vulnerable crevice or gap between the horizontal and vertical surfaces. Flashing, if it is a waterproof material, is made to be quite thin and to fold and bend to outsmart the raindrops that might seek to move against it and against gravity. And they will. Raindrops are you know, often, they used to tell us raindrops are smarter than architects in their ability to defy physics. Um, but flashing itself, if you think about it, is also a technique of trying to apply a channeling, a routing, or a circuiting of potential water and moisture away from vulnerable areas into areas where it's less vulnerable or you know, off-site. As a consequence, flashing performs a type of conduit or micro-infrastructural maneuver of creating something that is an individual surface or plane hammered as thin as it could be or manufactured in its infinite thinness to still be, perm uh, to make it durable, but not permeable. And to do this in such a the way that it can be not just affordable, but easily tooled or machined on site and customized. As a type of laminate, flashing is one of the most cost effective in maintaining the integrity of a building. And it offers a metaphor of a different type of thinking about skins. This is something that is perhaps like a very thin layer of clothing. You can think of the protective eyewear that you put on your glasses or have on glasses, for example, a layer of ultraviolet light repelling uh, plastic on the glasses um, or your eyeglasses as is also a type of laminate system. 
a very thin discrete layer with very precise performance specifics applied in the appropriate sequence. Not all high performing thin surfaces need to be at the surface to work, which creates the possibility of composite systems, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And here, this example from the aerospace industry where a lot of laminates and high performance laminates are engineered and developed. We can see just a very simple explanation from a textbook of how to make a, an airplane lightning proof. Um, and they do get struck by lightning, believe it or not. And if you look here, the very simple system is there's a copper layer, which would attract it, a silicon rubber layer, which obviously is resistant, and then the resistive sheet underneath it. Each of these are interlocking, and they posi are positioned in a, uh, such a way that the insulation factor of the rubber and the resistive sheet to prevent the lightning from going anywhere except on staying on the surface on the copper level. Uh, so this copper sheet itself as a laminate, we think of it as a type of flashing for electricity, channels the lightning strike away from the vulnerable parts of the plane. This type of surface needs other surfaces to work. It cannot simply be clad or applied to existing surfaces, but it needs to be part of a, a composite or sandwich type of system. You can think of the other sorts of uh, engineering feats done in a simple airplane, like smoothing the surface to minimize drag and resistance, the ability to uh, design it, for example, on the windows to prevent uh, freezing temperatures and ultraviolet uh, radiation from penetrating to the inside of the plane. Each of the surfaces of the airplane have been broken down into high-performing layers, each with their optimal uh, criteria for performance, each with a strong set of attributes, and in some cases, the ability to operate in different layers or to be uh, uh, and it's reconfigured. There was even an experiment for a while with Boeing of changing the fuselage construction entirely from a rip plus a skin condition into one single co um, common thread uh, polycarbonate fiber that was, was intended to be a, a spun or wound around the entire fuselage. Imagine making an airplane from one continuous piece of thread and weaving it and binding it together. Uh, that goes against the laminar or lamination model, and it talks about a very different type of structural integrity and also very different configuration of the surfaces because one single thread wound into the entire fuselage over a period of many many weeks would also have an infinite surface perhaps in terms of the outside layer that thread as well as have things on the inside of the thread too so this is the basis of thinking about how the infinite thin layers of the world can respond to some ideas about engineering but also respond to a deeper driving force uh, of having high performance or multiple layers of uh, effectiveness. This in many ways is a push back against the touching receptors of the skin, having surfaces that emit data, that block moisture, that change any sort of condition between the inside and the outside, and how to have those performative layers like in the human skin become increasingly thin. To do so requires tests, prototypes, um, uh, research and obviously uh, applications in a variety of fields. And these technologies will slowly transfer usually from military industrial practices to commercial practices into artistic practices. So we can see, for example, here, a very small, small flexible set of processors that could be something that's woven into a pocket or included in the fabric in a room or placed inside some of the uh, uh, fabric on a chair in an airplane too. You can imagine that the application of this layer becomes an additive, something like a force multiplier or way of adding a new type of environmental um, conditioning into the thin surfaces of the world. Here we can see something that's a solar collector. This is the idea of taking those massive solar collectors you might buy for your roof and trying to compact it into the smallest size possible. It is possible to get solar collectors now that are completely transparent and they've been adapted even for you use in highway paving. So the idea of using uh, surfaces or infinitely thin surfaces as a way of collecting and storing energy gives another set of potential performance uh, criteria satisfaction to the designing of other surfaces of the world. You could also imagine some to do uh, cleaning or repair of environmental conditions. A magnetic surface would attract heavy leads out of the air, for example. And you can start to fantasize and project all sorts of new performance criteria. And 
terms of finding a technology, flattening it to make it as extensive and thin as possible, and then conceptually wrapping it around other things. We can imagine a world where we're able to pull out and roll a touch screen, stick it on any surface, and then put it back in our pockets when we don't need it, replacing the rigidity of the phone. We can also imagine what sort of a world we live in where all of the screens, the touch screens of the world become peel and stick, like little labels when we were kids the possibility of a world where any service can be turned into a projection screen or a sensor, or in many ways could be used to communicate so that we wouldn't be reliant entirely on uh, devices, but we can um, posit the existence, the future existence of this interoperability or transience of the technology itself as it moves from surface to surface, from location to location. So it's not simply the attributes of the chemistry and the physics and the mechanics of the materials, with those attributes and the devices themselves also becoming infinitely thin. In the old days, we used to <clears throat> have this dream of the idea of the television screen being just a, a, a napkin or handkerchief you could pull out of your pocket, unfold, watch, and put away. Newspapers and the idea of a, a non-print-based newspaper, liquid newspaper and liquid type um, in the 80s and 90s in the early digital age had become quite commonplace perhaps. Um, in terms of this malleability and the thinness. The thinner the material, the easier it is for it to bend and conform and adopt to the prefigured surfaces of forms in the world. We can imagine a world where um, in the same way you would put a bandage across a wound, you could laminate different parts of uh, buildings, chairs, uh, desks, textbooks, whatever it is you're working with and add these other high performing layers. And Thin film technologies, there's usually layers of, uh, as I mentioned before, that each perform in a different way. You can think of using standard uh, approaches in uh, engineering and mechanics and just trying to make them as flat and as thin as possible while still keeping the efficiency. Um, you can see in this diagram from a science textbook, thin film transistors, batteries, photovoltaics, all operating as different material applications that exist underneath a protective film like this can itself too. This is a, a way of thinking about, again, that flattening of the world. And remember, our skin is not flat and two-dimensional, nor is paper. There's always a thickness to things. But the question that is used in the design of this ultra-thin environment that we're proposing is a question of how thin can something get for it to still function or perform? And also, when something becomes too thin, how does that change its status, its effectiveness, its usefulness in the world? The graphene revolution, um, here you can see an example of uh, one book about this, um, the idea of the carbon ring that creates a, a super rigid uh, texture and surface, a structure that's too small to see, but resists any sort of attempt to break it. it is a high performing material available to us as an engineer. Imagine an entire fuselage of an airplane woven from this material or string of it. Other examples of ultra thin engineered surfaces, Gore-Tex, which is used, for example, in the military applications as a type of bulletproof layering inside a, a fabric of clothing. It won't, uh, it will potentially diminish some of the impact pressure, but it will certainly prevent the penetration of, of certain ballistics. The graphene curtain, and I mentioned a, a very few molecules thin that you see in this configuration absorbs 99% of the light and acts as a thermal and particular a optical barrier between two different environments. The graphene curtain and cortex as a material are ultra thin surfaces that function and perform at to a high degree and high standard. They add a sense of value, both a financial value, but also a performative value that were originally intended as probably simple wishes and desires, imagination perhaps. If we look at surfaces themselves, it's probably important to the theorize them um, in their different possibilities. We cannot accept a static surface. We have to understand that surfaces themselves have meanings and have effects. And that these are very dependent on the context, on the data being transmitted or the information that needs to be conveyed, as well as the range of possible modes of perception. Even distance has some influence on this. Look at this illustration illustration of a body in space. You see something that looks maybe like fabric, like clothing. And if you've seen this image before, you know this artist 
The secret of his work is to come up with regular forms that are constructed without computation or calculation, but have a mixture of directionality and a mixture of randomness together. By taking paint, oil paint and other paints, and pouring them into water at different temperatures in different color mixtures, and then photographing them, we start to see something like the fabric of the world, something that could be tentacle, something that could be clothing or fabric, an umbilical cord. The optical possibilities of this form is also quite fleeting. The water itself that holds it as a medium is photographed and appears transparent. The paint itself, whose function is to land on a, a destination to have a directionality. This is taking Jackson Pollock's all over action paintings one step farther and allowing the paint to find its own form through micro deformations and the densities and consistencies of the paint and the water relative to each other. It illustrates a principle of growth and form generation that is only partially directed by human will or subject it would be impossible to get the paint to perform into an ideal platonic form, just as it would be impossible to get this to be an entirely random distribution of paint in solution in the water. It's somewhere in between, kind of a heuristic. As you can see, the triangular shape of the paint moving off of the central axis as its weight and the density distributes it into a form that is more of a cone, but an organic, tessellated, or corrugated form that also produces in the photography the required towards this one moment of the transition, something like the appearance of a film still. It has an ornate quality to it, and it might be a place where we can register or acknowledge the presence of beauty, attractiveness, or interest in the form itself, but it's not a form that refers to anything outside of itself. Because there's no intentionality, it doesn't have that indexical quality of signifying or representing something else that's absent. It is quite literally an instant of time time captured through the logic of the photographic image of a process of flow. And this idea of flow and the idea of the static image of the flow is the basis for a lot of media representations, but it's not actually the way the skin works. The flows in and through the skin are constant. The appearance or the singularity or the continuity of the skin is also uh, appears in images and in, uh, even in selfies and things as a fixed condition. But even even the skin itself is not fixed, depending, again, on the differentiations between inside and outside states and conditions, the skin's pores can be quite large or almost non-existent. This has everything to do with responsivity and particularly that fundamental tension or friction between the inside and the outside that more often than not over time will produce a skin or surface condition. You can imagine a homogeneous material, say ice, slowly melting and turning into droplets of water as the surface itself becomes smooth, but but also receding. You can imagine timber planks outside weathering under the same rain conditions, slowly losing their color, slowly losing their planar integrity, slowly losing their resilience and their fibrous qualities as they erode and disappear into um, the ground. So we can understand that the surface of, of things gives the appearance, even if they're not intended to be such, as having skins. And so this is the basis, I think, of surface theory, that whatever form or whatever process you place into the world that our eyes will read the closest elements or this surface condition as an object, or we will read it as a type of continuous membrane. And yet, in fact, what we're looking at here is just something that is surface deep. It is quite literally paint falling through the water. And yet in this process of uh, phenomenological analysis that I'm performing here, we can start to see how it creates ambient qualities. The nuances of the color, the textures, the forms themselves, if we were to construct this manually, it would take a great amount of time. It would be very difficult to write a script to get this exact shape or to come up with a series of flows that has the shape at this moment of time as an interval. It tells us a lot about how space itself works, that we read the invisible space between walls where all of the functional activity happens, where the oxygen is, as a void. It's something as architects we don't draw. We draw the walls, the skins, the boundaries, the surfaces that the space has as its limits. When actually actually live between the walls. We occupy the space between the surfaces of paint or the other surfaces of the world. And this is a space filled with um, impressions, with uh, everything from pollen to oxygen to little uh, microorganisms. It's also filled with a lot of sensory perceptions, lighting conditions, temperatures, physics, that allow us to read and interpret this through our skin and through our eyes. This gap between our body and the walls is itself the essence of the art architectural spatial problem.
oppositions, and they change and shift over time, as we do as well. So we can imagine that space that we occupy in building as being something ambient. It is something that is forced to occur repeatedly under shifting circumstances, where a place where atmosphere is held and can be represented in both architectural drawings preceding the making of architecture and in the photographic representations of media architecture after it's made. But I would argue that our bodies flow through these spaces and these spaces also flow through buildings as they connect to the outer atmosphere. To reverse it or make it more obvious, imagine filling a room with water. All of a sudden the space is not a void, the space that is between the body and the surface of the room is now almost like an aquarium. You can see in this representation too, this photo collage, how that might be perceived. This sense of immersion of being inside of space, here the ballerina hovering in the middle of the room, um, but also at the bottom of the pool, as you can think about it, by considering a 100% humidity condition here of aquatic life, and it looks like a Palladian villa, uh, you can start to understand this perception of that space between the body and the walls as a type of immersive environment. It's just that the utility uh, functionalism um, that tells us that we have to say, use the, uh, the living room always for living and the kitchen always for cooking. We can also imagine because of this spatial condition of immersion, that because there's different flows of light, there's different flows of bodies, different functions that can happen in a space over time, that everything in the environment itself is only notionally or partially suggested by the surfaces. So surfaces can direct and they can mark intentions, but rarely can they force a particular behavior or perception on humans. If you think about this example here of bioceramics, <clears throat> this is um, an aerogel, which is a, a synthetic material uh, based on the uh, idea of glass construction. Uh, but if you imagine taking glass, or in some cases, high performing plastics or polymers and filling them with air but aerating them in the uh, production of the process before they cool and form a solid that you can create shapes that are more like sponges imagine a sheet of glass with a sponge-like quality that's 90 percent air or more this material exists and aerogel is actually quite good at keeping transparency or at least translucency because of the nature of the glass but also for thermal insulation it's the material that if you laminate it between other surfaces that are transparent, you can get something that is close to a translucent surface, but also have a kind of insulation property you find it's something much more solid. Um, and that's because of the, the use of the pockets of air that occur within this. There's also ways to make concrete work this way. Having concrete that's filled with more and more air and still performs a structural function, particularly the ability of the reinforcing bars, which can also be non-metal. Um, to take the tension, you can actually have high-performing concrete that's incredibly thin if you decide and can calibrate uh, the placement of the, the air and distribute it evenly in the process of curing. So here's the idea of a type of logic that uh, philosophers like Sloterdijk called foams or spheres thinking in terms of bubbles, but also thinking about taking away the density of materiality while still keeping some of it present as a performing material. This is not something that would work on the exterior layer of your skin, but on the dermis level, many of those systems that we saw are not uniformly distributed. You do not have nerve endings everywhere. Their distribution is actually in the same way that these openings occur, somewhat regular. Or you can think about the octopus skin and the non-random, non-identical distribution of different uh, sensors uh, and emitters that allow it to produce any sort of configuration. So this idea of bioceramics, working with systems where uh, ceramic uh, making imitates biological processes, can create some very high, high power and uh, high performative uh, layers in the construction of architecture and the planet. We can also think about, um, if we uh, use this example, for example, of prototyping, the use of different uh, circular shapes to create a pattern, but also to create volume. The idea of hollowing out a volume is a different type of surface. Here, the surface is not the six sides of the cube. Here, the surface is actually the outer side, the inner side, and the two circular sides of each ring. So this is something that has large volume and a pretty substantial area uh, being covered by mostly void. By hollowing out, as I'm calling it, by, by turning solid into a sponge, uh, 
we can create very different dynamic understandings of surface. Here, the surface is not planar or laminar. Here, the surface is something in between dimensions, perhaps, something that is closer to a sponge. And as such, these spongy spaces, these spaces filled with spaces or holes filled with holes can create a very different type of surface performance and criteria uh, uh, satisfaction that happens in those areas of physics and chemistry, but also in terms of aesthetics. So when we look at this, you might see something like pasta, or you might see these springs in a mattress being re reconfigured. But you can also look at this and say, here is a volume or here is a uh, element that could be in space. This could be a a table or a desk. This could also be, you know, the seat for uh, someone on the uh, pilot's cabin in the airplane. This could also be a layer that insulates or that performs other sorts of functions um, at a very fine scale as one of the surfaces in aerospace or in architecture as well, or even in clothing. Um, this is a sample I found um, just looking around at engineering fields at how different surfaces can uh, collapse and be flattened. Here you can see a very simple system based on the human muscles um, and within the body underneath the surface, taking on different configurations and flexibility. We can also look at, as I said, aesthetically, and in the case of Jun Aoki, a very talented Japanese architect, constructed an exhibition space by taking finely woven fibers and stringing them up vertically. He created something like a shimmering surface, like a gauze or a layer that allows translucency, but also creates a layer of optical effects. Like the artist Sivertsal who put the uh, paint in the water. You cannot control the exact shape, configuration, and placement of the accidental imagery that happens on, on the surface because everything from the movement of the wind to the temperature will bend and form each of these fibers. So in a way, it produces a non-determinist optic of performance or at least aesthetic pleasure or visual delight. And that was the intention. This shimmering surface effect is something that artistically is of great significance and perceptually is important for us in terms of everything from wayfinding to responding to, um, I guess, the quality of the space and its atmosphere. In doing this, we have neither a glass wall nor a opaque wall. But we have something that is a very thin gauze that creates a film that blurs vision slightly and creates a, a nebulous zone. It thickens the border between inside and outside at the same time that thins the physical material to allow that to happen. <clears throat> Let us consider how this plays out in environments as well. I want to think about surfaces and how they unfold and interact and shape and also respond and react and uh, in some ways can even disappear within environments. A little bit of biography. One of the first things I got to do when I finished my PhD was uh, start uh, my teaching career on a, a lucky opportunity and invitation at the Illinois Institute of Technology. This was the first university job that I had in a full-time capacity, teaching what was called the history of modern thought. It wasn't a course on modern architecture, and it wasn't a course on intellectual history, but a Venn diagram intersecting the two. The length and time span of the modern architecture was roughly from Paxton's Crystal Palace in 1849, up until the time of the, uh, the course I was teaching, which was the very close end of the previous millennium, uh, 1998. In the process of, of understanding this uh, project, uh, this is where I got to teach almost every day. Um, I came to appreciate in this uh, architecture school designed by Mies van der Rohe, when he and a few of the others like Hilbersheimer, um, Moholy Nagy, had fled the Bauhaus in Germany and relocated to Chicago, um, and set up what intend, was intended to become a new Bauhaus. Mies turned very explicitly towards industrialization and repetition, and as Frampton pointed out, a kind of classi classicizing tendency in the organization of these subtle planes and defining space. One of the things that Mies did quite well was to take the six sides of a volume and to dematerialize as many of them as possible. In this case, walls don't separate. They allude to, they point, or they mark possible differences. The area we're looking at here, uh, the wood plane, um, as it faces the, uh, looks like the south side of the building, was a space divider, not a wall. The exterior surface, as you can see, was designed with two types of glass. At eye level, for the architecture students to stay focused, is a translucent panel that makes the outside world milky and homogenous. 
above eye level at the clear story level on the same surface but using a different chemistry and different glass. And this was replaced when I was there, actually. Um, they, they've got the transparent glass and the uh, recessed ceiling that uh, seems to levitate. Mies placed the structure on the outside always so the internal space is smooth and continuous. And he creates the clear visual appearance of an endless continuity of floor plan and overhead plane. This is a type of architecture that is extensive. From any space in the building, you can see the sky and the horizon. The walls that divide are actually smaller planes that you can see over, which follows again a particular medieval understanding of light and space. In this environment, we can start to see the idea of a prismatic space, or as Blake and others called it, Mises universal space that can infinitely extend, a space that's accessible for those who are disabled, for people who are disoriented, uh, for those who are coming and performing their daily routines and rituals in the building, either as students, faculty, their visitors. These sorts of environments are open and at the same time they're high industrial and, and high tech. And so in the course when I was teaching this, I tried to give the intellectual foundations for things such as transparency and functionalism that are driving this approach towards architecture and use Mises building as a constant reference for that. This is the place where he imagined that the future generation of American architects in the middle of the, um, uh, the industrial little zones around the Great Lakes and in the middle of the great breadbasket of the world that Chicago was a terminal station for. We had all the opportunities and all the appearances of abundant and potentially infinite resources. Um, when I was teaching there, I was also uh, recognized that the phenomenological conditions of the space shifted drastically depending on your position, on the lighting, the time of day, and even, dare I say it, one's mood or attitude towards the building. The building and its almost invisible thinness uh, with an exoskeleton structure hidden from view with planes of glass and surfaces that barely uh, uh, acknowledge their presence in space. The environment itself became a shimmering uh, interplay of different surface effects. As I've shown in some of the other work, when a material gets very, very thin, it starts to have a translucent quality, but also a material that's quite polished will also have a reflectivity. This was something Mies was a master of in terms of determining the interplay and the dialogue between different types of reflective, reactive, and absorptive surfaces. So regardless of their material, the opaque glass, as you can see there, the frosted glass, has less reflectivity than the polished stone floor. The steel painted black absorbs all light and starts to create a dynamic rhythm in contrast with the glowing translucent panels of the exterior glass. And all of the subtle deviations in the floor can appear as it looks here as a type of pond or a type of water surface. There's something quite deliberate and intentional, something quite haunting about this approach towards minimalism and the strong attention to the treatment of the attributes of the surfaces. Even in Mises' early work, I would argue you can always find at least one translucent panel or surface and uh, you can have opaque surfaces trying to act like mirrors and you can have solid materials trying to disappear and you can have glass taking on whole different ranges of reflectivity and uh, creating dialogues, particularly across corners, both the corners of the building as well as the corners of the internal spaces. These were things that Mies often tried to dissolve by not only transposing transparency, translucency, opacity, and reflectivity, he created kind of a peekaboo game between the qualities of materials and their physical chemistry. Sometimes that which is reflective is not glass, and sometimes glass does not function as a transparency. And this is something it took me a long while to appreciate and to understand this aspect of the transience of attributes across materials in his very limited and deliberately limited palette of materials. This transient quality to me seemed to speak of a type of haunted minimalism, where by reducing things to an almost zero condition, almost like an architecture writing degree zero, the very subtle differences, even at the chemical level, produced dramatic influence on the mood and the tone and the character of the space. And this, like a kaleidoscope, shifted its characteristics and its tone and its ambience during a 24-hour cycle quite dramatically. Let's jump ahead to uh, Tokyo, one of the first places I got to work as a young architect on an internship right after I finished my master's. <clears throat> this is before I had uh, worked in Chicago. Um, a project that had just been published right before I went to Tokyo by an architect who I quite admired, uh, Toyo Ito, uh, came up with a 
hypothetical design for urban nomads. In the case of Japan, he was working in the context of the uh, built environment of a high density, rapidly, uh, um, almost superheating in the uh, economic bubble period, um, to the point where housing became increasingly difficult. People were commuting sometimes two hours a day to and from work, and the uh, urban nomad became a reality. A lot of salary men and salary women had to live in very itinerant housing particularly if they were working late in the office and couldn't get back to their homes because the public transportation systems couldn't support um, that. So he tried to design as a hypothetical project a type of temporary minimum dwelling for urban nomads. This was a time when people could potentially live out of a backpack with a laptop, but also people in high caliber, high performing jobs. So he mixed a very old building typology, the nomad tent, going back to ancient times called the POW, with flexible, collapsible furniture as a prototype and infused it like Mies did with the most advanced technologies possible to also add luxury and glamour. So in the same case that Mies did in his work, particularly in Crown Hall, Toyo Ito attempts to fuse those ancient primeval types and uh, clear the condition of transience, thinness and uh, impermanence uh, with the expectation of high design and high glamour and high performing materials to accomplish that the exhibition, this prototype. You uh, never got to see uh, millions of these uh, laying across the city, wedged in between billboards, hanging underneath fire escapes, uh, perched on the corners of roofs, but they could. And that was the intention was to test as an experiment, what sort of minimal dwelling, the term that we can trace from the Bauhaus through the Siam conferences into a lot of urban planning in post-war Europe. This minimum dwelling, here's, from the inside recalls that mythical origin of the nomadic tent combined with a high luxury, high transparency environment for people to create temporary uh, living space. You can imagine placing this in a location as you work as a temp for two weeks on a roof somewhere, coming and commuting back and forth to work and freeing up all that time in your schedule. And here you can see everything from furniture to um, living equipment, uh, the kettle, for example, the mirror and the makeup case, the uh, uh, radio, all of these uh, offering a type of minimized um, affluence, type of not austerity, a uh, deprivation, but an elegant selection and careful crafting of elements in the space between them. The building itself as a temporary pavilion or tent is duplicated in the furniture, same sort of frame logic and the diaphanous thin ephemeral skins create that layering and also the translucency that allows you to see through one volume of one space into another. He translated that experiment into uh, the Tower of Wounds project. Um, and the Tower of Wounds project had a, a reactive light skin, different systems, structural enclosure, lighting, interacted as the environment sounds change, like a, a lantern. We can see that this approach towards thin surfaces as a modification or a mediator can be applied in all sorts of uh, practical ways as well. Here in the Tracy Connor Architects project, they They've added a punched metal screen, something that recalls the elegance of a lot of uh, medieval uh, Mediterranean and, and other environments where a barrier or a layering between the inside and outside is necessary to prevent the solar gain from entering the interior volume of the building. This type of veiled architecture could also occur at different layers inside a building, giving the appearance of a thick surface that's actually composed of discrete layers, something like the skin again. This is where that biological analogy of a building skin comes into play. If we keep in mind that a wall can be composed of multiple layers, including emptiness, and that each of these can be used to react to light, to sound, to smells, to uh, uh, chemistry, to even toxins or pollutants that can be made performative, we're getting close to understanding skin as multiple layers, with each of the surfaces becoming a type of interface within the walls or within those densities. Take, for example, the case of the Beinecke Library. This is one of the most shocking places one of my friends took me to when I visited Yale's campus when I was at Harvard. And uh, from the outside, it appears to be quite, a, uh, uh, I guess, opaque uh, and somewhat brutalist construction. When you come to the inside, it's an entirely different world. This type of veiled architecture actually is a high performing environment. The rare books are assembled, as you can see, into a very, very uh, heavily engineered uh, volume. 
This volume is made out of fireproof steel and encased in glass. And it has, as you can see, spaced with all the lightings, it has the ability to absorb all of the oxygen and vent it out in, I think it was less than 60 seconds. They said if you're inside the cube of rare books and the alarms go off, you've got 60 seconds before the oxygen is gone, um, uh, which is a very short amount of time, as you can imagine. But that fire suppression system becomes a type of cage. And that cage is inserted in a larger volume, which is the reading area, which is intended to be also, in many ways, um, resistant to uh, fires. The structural frame, if you look at it, is based on the idea of the see the vaulted ceiling the, uh, being translated into the facade, but the facade has a certain crenellation or articulation of the panels. Those panels that form the exterior facade, which you can see at the back there, are actually sheets of stone cut so thin that they become translucent. Their shape recalls what at that time was an advanced media form, the television screen, and also creates within it a different pattern like a kaleidoscope. This is not the Mies van der Rohe transparency translucency, this is something that's approaching much more of a, a lush articulated um, and saturated surface theory. The structural skin, which is the framing conditions, the grids, holds within it panels, panels of stone, and their wafer thin quality makes them membranes, not to opaque masonry systems, but infill panels that transmit uh, the data of the outside world in terms of light and temperature. Trieto design for an opera. Here you can imagine in the same logic of uh, perforations and holy space, a manifold. This is a repeating typology. You can see the building is composed of something like a carburetor where di different light wells and different circulation spaces, different performance spaces start off as blobs and volumes. And then a manifold skin condition is folded in and through and between them. Here are the different programmatic spaces or the bubble diagrams that generated them slowly dissolve but never leave this manifold condition. It is not simply paper architecture or plastic layer, but it has a relatively uniform thickness to it, anticipating later high-performing concrete construction. And it looks like something could either be an engine part or a larger building. Uh, this intended construction, uh, and when you, if you look up the results of it, is very close to this, this structure, but it also has a purity to it as a prototype. It shows us a manifold as something where the inside and the outside start to move through valves, through openings, through apertures. The building is not composed of rooms, but it's composed of different volumes of space with different degrees of enclosure. You can see this also in a, a design, very popular approach in the late 80s, early 90s of the folded plate. Here, the museum condition by Neil Denari as a prototype uh, is, you can, as you can see, probably came from a single piece of paper being cut and folded and wrapped. This folding condition, theorized by people like Jules Deleuze and other philosophers, has the idea of uh, interlacing inside and outside and creating complex dynamic systems. You can have spaces that are partially enclosed, totally enclosed, or totally open, transiting or transitioning from one to the other without having any doorways, without having any sort of barriers. This fantasy of a universal space is being articulated with a very different logic, not a laminated frame or the, uh, the uh, multi-layered enclosure system, but here the single plate becoming floor, becoming wall, becoming roof, becoming exhibition itself. You can think of also the possibility of the structural integrity that comes from the fold. The fold is a physical object, not as a spatial fold, as you find, say, in a croissant. But if you think of the physical fold in, in origami and how that can be used, particularly if it's translated into concrete or other high-performing planar elements, can become the basis for, for a structurally sound and strong architecture composed of very thin crenellated surfaces. You can use repeating or tiled or non-identical forms to create a rich variety of different surfaces today. That idea of the folded plate or the idea of buildings based on folding as a type of surface theory or as a type of skin is also manifest here in this uh, complex, the swimming pool complex designed by MBRGB. Let's pick this apart for a minute because what we see happening here in this provocative design is a variation of a very traditional Corbusian planar stacking that you would have in uh, this early idea of the um, Maison Domino. The horizontal plane and the thin Pelotti structural columns maximizes the structural strength while minimizing the need for enclosure. 
the advantage that happens here that's only prepare, um, propositional in uh, Corbusier's five points towards new architecture is that we don't have to accept either the horizontality of planes as a given condition, as Corbus had assumed. Corbus had argued by making horizontal planes and uh, structural piloti out of concrete, or later as hybrids with steel or other tensile structures, um, by reducing architecture to its bare bone system as a structural system minimized, it freed up movement of bodies, spaces, the placement of non load bearing enclosure, both in the internal guts of the building as well as the external skin. And this is a study model. This is a compositional model. Obviously, the building would need a much more sophisticated and responsive skin. But here, the structure becomes a surface. And this is where the innovation is quite provocative. Using that same sort of logic of pockets, crevices, holes, bends, insertions, and slices, simple planes of concrete start to become two-dimensional into three-dimensional into four-dimensional. You can start to see the openings as they relate to each other and perforate and the next space is separated. When the floor becomes a wall and the perforations occur, we start to get something like lines of sight, lines of force, circuits, trajectories, openings, apertures, and the possibility to see through things in a bleak and angled way too. We can see the great range of different heighted spaces, modest, compact human spaces, vast monumental spaces and spaces in between. We see the possibility of the fundamental distinction in between interior space and exterior space being contradicted in a sense by these openings that happen between things and the, whether the ambiguity that shows up in the model of am I inside, am I outside, can that be realized in the final architecture? Can the overhead plane at the top be read and articulated as a type of landscape as if the whole building is a type of maybe subterranean ship that is brought up to the surface on some sort of ramp system or some sort of hydraulic lift? like you might find in an aircraft carrier. Can this sort of building have an orientation that would start to deform based on the sun angles and latitude? That certainly could. Would the skin conditions absorb that or could the planes themselves respond to that? Would the lines of sight in the opening shift depending on the climate, whether there's uh, excess of heat or excess of cold, whether spaces needed to be insulated or they need to be exposed to the outside? You can imagine how this hypothetical design would start to respond like an organism would, like the octopus at the bottom of the ocean, would respond to the microclimate conditions that form it and where it could be inserted. If this is a prototype, it's missing that layer of climatic and uh, regional data, and it's also missing a second type of skin, which is the non-structural skin. And here, as in Corbusier's five points, it's left missing as notional, as something to be added later. <clears throat> If we reduce architecture and particularly the layering and the depth and the strength and the uh, monumentality you would associate with say load bearing construction and move towards things that are more light and delicate, even if they, they have that continuous smooth universal space, the spaces themselves start to take an extensive or formless quality. In these conditions, as I was pointing out with Mises Crown Hall, surfaces, the reflectivity, their data, uh, uh, sets, their actual qualities become increasingly important in an environment where there's less variety of elements. That is to say, by reducing architecture to a low res environment, it is the affects, the atmospheres, the tonalities that become more significant. By reducing architecture to bare minimum components or eliminating anything that is unnecessary, the dream of a minimalist or an extreme minimalism, by doing that, whatever remains in that environment takes on greater significance as a deviation from the uniform field condition. In this sense, you can start to talk about architecture as something that is dissolving at the same time it is materializing as space. As the physical wrappers, containers, surfaces, and structures are minimized and disappear, as is the intention of the architects I've shown, what comes to replace that in terms of our haptic and optic sensory data is the quality the space itself, its atmosphere. There's a great deal of writing about this from uh, contemporary architects, from Baum to Zimtorf to Plasma and others, who look at that affective quality of the space as the fundamental design project. If you think about it, in the same way that you would use a mold to cast something out of plexiglass, like a paperweight, you can also think of the architecture itself as being a mold or as a, a casement 
around the emptiness of the space itself. But these spaces are never empty. They are filled with, as I said before, uh, movement, pollen, light, they've got temperatures. They also have embedded within them anticipations, functions, memories. The space between the walls, the space between the surfaces, the space that flows in and through the different wireframe constructions is a space latent with meaning, latent with experience. It is the event space waiting to happen. It is a space that asks our eyes and our bodies to cross it. It is a space that makes our skin anticipate uh, the different stimuli that can be encountered in those very discrete places where the hand or the foot would touch the building. What if architecture had no data at all? What if architecture, like an empty uh, uh, cassette or an empty uh, floppy disk, uh, was a, a blank media? What if it was something that waited for data and sensory impressions to occur in a standby state, in neutral, in, in an empty field condition? In this project by Campo Baeza in Spain, an office building, we can see a variation of that Mesian fantasy. Here we have, again, the reduction of the structure to uh, simplified planes and structural columns. But in this case, the, the glazing around the outside, the glass wall that would surround the Mies building, has actually been turned into a double glass wall. This operates as a type of chimney, or could be a type of chimney, but also a thermal barrier. I've learned from experience that designing a glass building with double wall is twice as expensive as a single blank glass wall. But it also creates a visual field and a thermal gradient and a type of optical layering that may justify the extra cost. It may produce other effects and other values. Here you can start to see in contrast with the stone, again, following the Mesian tradition. In the Spanish context with its Mediterranean heat, this building is a challenge to the conventions of monumental or symbolic architecture. It is something that ties into that Mesian tradition of minimalism in a very explicit way that other architects would recognize. It also, in many ways, is a very sophisticated building that tries to disappear, but it does it in a very hostile way, I would argue, through the aggressive use of multiple layers of glass, whose edges form a cage or wireframe that prevent its total disappearance. Notice how in the distance, as the building recedes towards the vanishing point, it appears to dissolve into the stone surfaces that stand in sharp opaque contrast to its transparency. This is probably the most productive space for understanding the effect of this building, not at the front where you can see clearly, but in the peripheral conditions of the vanishing points themselves in terms of perspectival theory. The vanishing point is a place of disappearance of lines. We can see the building also disappearing at the two corners as they move towards the vanishing points. So that that which is close to us becomes extra clear and in many ways ultra refined, whereas that that is receding and moving the distance dissolves into the environment. If we reverse that, we can also think about the artificial nature component of architecture that attempts to create natural environments or bring natural environments into architecture is a high form of artifice. You can see in this museum example, that the trees at the outside are placed into a type of, uh, not just just a, a planting bed, but as a wedge of space jammed in to divide the two different ramps. This sort of innovative approach, which is driven by geometry and intention to uh, split and to sever space, to bifurcate space and turn it from a single homogenous volume into a, a, almost a, a nervous uh, ascent and descent through these inclines, fractures the space as well as, as connects the inside to the outside in a topological way that varies from, from the and Mason examples we've seen so far. We can also take some of the examples, probably more well known by people, of how to use surfaces. Um, and this is a project uh, coming from uh, Vienna, I believe. Um, and in this project, the artificial uh, or augmented reality is a series of animations of digital designs projected onto the surface of the museum. Here, the surface becomes the space, in many ways, a flying carpet over one's head, projecting the appearance of different geometries and different volumes, uh, occurring in a way that perhaps might not be as literal um, as people would do in, say, the Renaissance, or the, particularly the Baroque with the carbon of the surface that's created a fixed image or a fixed articulation of texture. But here, the augmented reality is created by two systems simultaneously, a physical presence of empty space that 
we occupy with our bodies, that space of the crossing, as we talked about chronologically. And we also have the projection of space, the back of the screen projecting these images in terms of their tonality and reflection on the other surfaces, binds the virtual and the real into an augmented and integrated environment. Both the surfaces and the spaces will change at different cycles. So it's not a static space. It is a constructive space. It is laminated between the physical and the virtual. And this double lamination provides a type of envelope that is shifting and responsive to us. Look at a museum uh, designed by Fuxas. We have a building within a building. We have the idea of, uh, it's a bit blurry, but you can start to see taking that approach in a slightly different direction and thinking about how would you skin a project like this? How can you make a loose volume or organic projection following some of the fuselage technology we've seen in aerospace into a museum itself that is composed of conceived of as a solid prismatic block of glass volume. And this is how it starts to materialize too. You can have different systems, different uh, semiotics for the different types of surfaces in and through buildings. Here you can see something like an alien ship or an organ in the body or um, maybe an animal in a cage uh, being developed in terms of radically different technologies, spaces, geometries, and also the surfaces. These two surfaces are in dialogue. The fuselage and the translucent surface of the uh, interior exhibition space and the transparent, um, highly citational modernist frame condition on the outside create a different type of tension. There's two insides to one outside. The uh, museum in Mexico City that obscures and hides through the surface any sort of reference to human scale, materiality, or function. Even as you enter into the building, this non-monumental entrance is uh, perhaps a visit to a future world or some sort of alien technology articulated and developed with a very simple tiling system of metal panels that are also engineered to move across the volume of concrete that they are clad to, but also obviously to work in terms of reflectivity, coloring, and a relationship to mask the volume behind it as a type of reflective surface condition. And talk about the friendly alien is another extreme example. Peter Cook of Archigland fame worked on this project in Grasse in Austria uh, using a laminated system. These skylights were also conceived of as sort of portholes or something either nautical or something from an alien geometry, but also so the cladding conditions, the ceramic panels that form the outside of these light and uh, exhaust ducts form an exterior skin to the building that's called by the, the people in the city, the friendly alien. You can see how the surface is conceived of as a ceramic cladding system with different technologies, including lights sticking out of them. And these uh, oculuses are these portholes bringing light into the building too. In the same way, a biological surface would split, separate, redirect, and operate it different scales, these different systems of transmission of light and of data. So too has this project tried to use a high-tech vocabulary and you can see the translucency of some of the ceramics and the way that this is constructed. The laminar nature of cladding is here highlighted and exaggerated and it's in the openings, in the violations, the ruptures, the breaks of that cladding that we start to see the other internal systems reveal themselves. And the last project I'll show is uh, by Future Systems a long time ago in uh, Birmingham, UK the Sainsbury department store, also following that surface logic of applying a particular uh, technical uh, scale or skin onto an existing building whose interior becomes mysterious. In the contrast with the Nisian projects and the Nisian inspired buildings where lightness and transparency and multiple layers produce ambiguous tensions between inside and outside, here it couldn't be rude enough to show that the inside stays secret and uh, concealed, a covert space whose function, whose scale, whose activities are obscured by the outside, and the outside is a type of wrapper, a type of environmental surface, or even something closer to a marketing sign that is blank, that projects nothing but opacity and a repeating pattern of singular forms cascading and wrapping around the volumetrics. The overall form itself follows the idea of distended volumes, following again the Baroque logic of the ellipse, the distorted field, the eccentric play uh, of bubbles and the exterior which hopefully marks that in an almost two-dimensional tactile experience of the panel repeated infinitely in array. Thank you very much, Thomas. So in that presentation, we tried to introduce different aspects of this. <clears throat> All right.
Thank you very much, Thomas, for the lecture. Very interesting about octopus uh, skin and human skin. Uh, I, I, I saw also some documentary about the octopus uh, legs. Mm. Uh, th there's, a, there's a fungus that can grow inside like uh, animals. Oh yeah. And uh, sometimes it goes inside like uh, these octopuses. And uh, it's like... Mm -hmm. uh, the creatures become zombies. So, so oh, yeah. for example, the leg can go by its own because it has a nervous system also. It's crazy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, yeah, there's, I've always felt that uh, some of the most uh, fascinating and horrific things that you can imagine all have their basis in studying nature. And uh, even as a small child, being um, taken to natural history museums, just the range of different types of species and animals and insects that live, always filled me with a sense of, of fascination and wonder. Uh, when I was a young boy and we moved to Florida, one of my first experiences was uh, uh, people pulling up a shark up onto the beach, which made me afraid of going in the water. But also look, looking at this, you know, it was a hammerhead shark, which is a really strange looking animal. It's always come out on the side. But watching this this shark on the beach, and then slowly watching it, you know, decompose and disappear back into the sands, was quite profound for me because I realized that the things in the world that we take for granted or assume are um, mo mobile or that have these these qualities, um, they're also quite fragile too. And I think because of that. Um, the, uh, the the situation is such that um, uh, you can also look up, uh, I think, zombie ants, and there's other sorts of creatures, other sorts of parasites that have to have very precise relationships. And I had a colleague who was studying this, that almost every parasite is customized for um, one type of species as the host, and they have to reconcile, particularly their skin conditions or their boundaries or, or their periphery. Um, some are quite uh, ghoulish, the ones that replace a, a fish's tongue, for example, the ones that can exist on or beneath the skin, uh, which affects a lot of mammals, for example, um, that have to, you know, draw from the host but not kill it. Um, again, horrific, horrific things happening in the natural world that, you know, fuel the gothic imagination, and the, kind of this dark side of nature. Um, it shows up in horror films in our dreams, too. Uh, but I, I, I also... I like to focus on the positive too, that um, some of the most interesting invention and developments like the uh, correlation between the dragonfly and the helicopter are also born from that you know, very sober analysis of what works and how it works in the natural environment too. So some of what I presented is more of a technological fantasy of increasingly thin laminated world. Um, there's a possibility that in, you know, uh, uh, endangered, decrepit, um, uh, abused or neglected buildings of using different types of laminates as a way of protecting them but also making them high performing or changing their function as well um, i remember someone i was talking to in heritage saying you should never 3d print a replacement for a component in a historical building but you can 3d print even things like titanium uh, implants for dental work so the range of materials we can 3d print is increasing and with that comes the flexibility and versatility of coming out with great range of sorts of forms as well as new materials that could be printed or manufactured in very thin components and used in the way that other veneers were used in, in architecture. One of my colleagues said, if you want to look at the future of uh, surface engineering, look at what's happening in dentistry. Because he said dentistry is a bit more experimental veneers and, and uh, uh, polymers are, are being tested. That and then, you know, a lot of it having to do with nanotechnology too, uh, where some things are being printed at you know 20 molecules thinness something that's imperceptible like some of those graphing uh, shields i showed people um, you can't even see what's being invented and you can't even imagine how it might influence the architecture but you can even think of a banal example like a faraday cage and how you can construct a faraday cage to prevent electromagnetics from getting into a room and doing that with the very thin filaments in textiles and hanging those as a tapestry in a space and no one would know the difference as well
So it kind of appeals to me in terms of that science fiction, you know, about what could happen approach. If we think about how even in uh, clothing for extreme environments, the design of uh, ski jackets and uh, shoes and boots and tents for hiking up the Himalayas here um, are getting, uh, their weight is going down each year more and more and their thermal insularity and performativity and waterproofing is increasing. And that's because the surfaces are being made and engineered to be more and more efficient efficient each time too. So that part fills me with hope and optimism too. Not that everything can be solved with the laminate, but uh, certain things, certain processes can be slowed or accelerated with the laminate. That's probably a better way to think about contemporary surface theory. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. Uh, for example, the, 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 the things that you showed about uh, solar panels that can be transparent also. Uh, for example, the uh, aerogel which which is like uh, ninety percent, uh, uh, and it's transparent also. So very interesting. Yeah, yeah I met a scientist in Australia from uh, Scandinavia who is a world expert in it, and he said, "See if you can find an architectural use for this." And I was like, "Ooh, that sounds fun." Um, so we spent a, a whole studio playing with it, um, and it's obviously each each uh, year it's going to. Be be uh, developed to be more and more high performing. So I think that's part of our uh, fun too, is that uh, you know even even the crudest of technologies and improvements with some optimism and a lot of effort and investment can be made to be quite uh, high performing. And when it's high performing, then it can crowd out some bad practices or some inappropriate materials too. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh... Uh, you showed also uh, the Toyo Ito um, nomadic lifestyles uh, on the roofs. Yeah. There's also, as I think he's a Japanese architect also, uh, Shigeru Ban. Yeah. He has uh, his office oh, yes. in France on, on the roof also. also. He doesn't yeah. use ultra thin surfaces, but it's also like a nomadic lifestyle. He doesn't his curtain house so he did one project yes yeah but he, he designed the curtain house where the facade was actually a retractable fireproof curtain and so it was an open balcony or closed to the outside too and it had almost a, a, a mason domino type construction on the interior and most architects i know will know shiroban from his experiments using uh, paper tubes as structure enclosure laminate systems for buildings so uh he went to Union, so he studied with John Hajek. And uh, I think he also uh, took um, that experimental approach towards materiality and you know some, some pretty strong spatial discipline too. And when I was working as a salaryman in Tokyo, uh, a lot of the uh, well-known architects now were just starting their practices and working in that environment where uh, if you've ever been to Tokyo, it's like one big pachinko machine, just you know, constant sounds, light and noise, and shops trying to outdo each other in terms of over stimulating your nervous system the sort of place where finding privacy and quiet became very expensive and hard to do so i was appreciated in particularly the tokyo context uh, efforts to create these little bubbles of minimalism and austerity and peace whereas in other places that seems to be more the constant and it, more often than not uh, one of my colleagues in japan told me he said many people prefer the traditional architecture but it is illegal to build with wood and paper in tokyo because because of the fire and earthquake codes. He said the contemporary challenge for us as architects in Tokyo, I remember him explaining this because he's showing shoji screens and tatami mats and uh, different uh, villas over time with uh, repeating but non-regular room sizes. And, things. and he said the traditional uh, materials and the aesthetic of that is still highly valued. But for us, the challenge is how to create the appearance of sunlight going through the trees and through the tatami or through the shoji screens, which are rice paper translucent onto the uh, woven thatch of the tatami mats. And he said, but we have to use concrete, glass, and steel. So we'll perforate the metal steel with irregular patterns to simulate how light moves through the trees. And we will frost the glass or put a frisket on it so it is translucent, like the shoji screens. And then we will do textures on the concrete itself to create that simulation of the textured grass at the tatami mat. And he says, we can get close to recreating nature using industrial 
materials, but particularly of the sound and the light and the feel of the space. And I've seen some concrete work there. They engineered the, uh, the formwork so much that the walls look like they're you know, made out of the gelatin or made out of butter. And you're like, is that concrete? That's so amazing. Um, so that was the challenge, how to recreate natural materials, or more importantly, the space between the natural materials and the appearance of sunlight coming through the trees using only advanced industrial materials. And I thought, what a significantly wicked problem. And so the, they spent a lot of time taking me to projects. Uh, Hiko Maki's work in particular, Toya Ito's work, really struck me when I was there um, as trying to work through that, uh, that transposition of the natural into the artificial or, you know, uh, the pre-modern into the uh, post or hyper-modern industrial. Um, and their architects often able to do that at domestic scale. Uh, doing it at urban scale is much more challenging. Unless I guess one tried to recreate a forest. Uh, Sui Fujimoto is probably the closest I've seen who could able to do that in his architecture in Japan. Toyota has a Mediateca that uh, also has like a structure mm -hmm. that uh, is close to forest yeah that, that looks and grows like trees yeah yeah, yeah 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 and so you could imagine it's an easy to grasp concept if you've ever been camping or a child lost in the woods you know how terrifying a forest can be but also when you look at it from above or look at it aesthetically uh, you can see how delightful it is too and how important it is for you know mental health and hygiene there's people who go forest bathing instead of water bathing to, to clear out their you know, stress from working in business, um, but recreating an artificial forest using industrial technologies and persuading people or, you know, working with their sensory apparatus to convince them it's forest, like harder to do than it sounds. And a lot of the times the ones that photograph like forest don't feel like a forest. And that's a bigger gap to challenge or to cross to. But yeah, that's a good example. It's, uh, it's, uh, one thing it's, uh, uh doing, um, I think the forest, uh, for example, when, mm -hmm. when the light hits, but uh, it's different when uh, you need to recreate the forest, like uh, it's, it's uh, the, for example, the, uh, the shades that, that the um, uh, forest produces, uh, it's different on yeah. a different type of the day. So you cannot have a yeah, yeah. 2D surface that, yeah. that does it. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the hardest thing to do because you can create something that looks like a photograph of a forest, but to actually feel like you're immersed in the forest. Mm. For me, uh, the phenomenological challenge uh, here, the cognitive challenge, was that image of the, the ballerina submerged into the Palladian space. I use that to show people that actually the space in the building has qualities and attributes, and that's actually the hardest thing to design. That we often have to use the surfaces around that to do that, and the same thing with this idea of an immersive nature or an unnatural nature to use Guipatati's term and to do it in a way that is compelling and perhaps uh, I don't know if anything would be as better than a tree in terms of its biological and ecological functions but to reproduce the effects and characteristics of the tree and graft them onto other materials is certainly possible um, but it's harder to do than it looks there's more skill involved in that than most people think I've seen also um, you showed us um a ceiling that's uh, with uh, VR or AR technology. That's uh, yeah. as the ceiling is changing. It's quite uh, interesting concept. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you seen? Um, there was a there was a like a concept also, but with a bus that uh, the screens, uh, the windows in the bus were replaced by screens, and it was all mapped and etc. The bus was uh, driving around town and uh, filled with kids that uh, huh. they were like uh, thinking they were going around Mars or something like this. Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah. Seen yeah. this? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good idea. Matthias Del Campo is the architect who did that AR VR um, installation. And the images that were shown were actually part of his design process for something else, too. So he, he does some, he's in Michigan, does some reaching from Vienna, I believe, does some fascinating work. And I was looking at some designs of future aircraft where they get rid of the windows entirely, and this might be what you're talking about, and replace them with um, screens so that you will, they'll appear transparent, but there's no glass anymore. And you can see the plane taking off because there's live sensors projecting the outside image on the inside. 
But then it could also, I imagine, like if you're going through a th- thunderstorm, it would project appearance of, you know, blue skies and no turbulence. <laughs> <laughs> or the idea of, you know, flying through a tunnel or something. And I was like, oh, you could have so much fun. Because the whole interior of the fuselage becomes a projection screen. So you don't even have windows, you know, aside from the chairs, the flooring, the lights, the uh, oxygen masks and the luggage storage, the rest of the pl- interior your screen so you could have that feeling of you know, being in any sort of environment whatsoever so the potential abuse of that is also quite horrific and fascinating too like i said you could uh, you make it look like you're flying right into you know right into the trees of the forest and terrify people or you know like a glass bottom boat you could potentially look down and see the forest you know the top of the trees and be really excited i don't know um, but yeah uh, it will see it usually we'll see these technologies first in science fiction films and then later they'll actually see be you know as as the children who see that grow into scientists and artists they eventually will actually see that come into reality i read an article a long time ago that said almost every technology in the original star trek tv show is now available at hardware stores um, so given enough time all of the science fiction technologies just become you know something you get at the store yes that's correct and uh, it starts from a book then it goes to the film yeah. and it goes to reality <laughs> yeah 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 and th- those time spans are deep they're getting shorter and shorter right yeah yeah i don't know how how much time you got more because it's uh it's it's uh... um yeah i'm close to it's uh getting past dinner time here yeah um, and, and uh christmas is coming so i've got to start wrapping some things too but um, yeah, yeah. Presents. i'm happy to i think in the first image i got my information yeah. yeah well that's why i was making a joke at the beginning about wrapping wrapping things <laughs> up and, you know, closing up the segment but, but also like, closing things or you know, making them into presents and thinking about that gifting aspect so um, no i'm very happy to, to pull some of these ideas together and i hope people found it intriguing um i'm curious to see if people will watch it and have comments later and uh, I, I think I disregarded the instructions to speak slowly I get excited and I lose track so um, that's just the way it comes out <laughs> <laughs> yes um, yes yeah, very very interesting the uh, this this uh, the stuff uh, you, you showed uh, where, where there are may probably maybe some other places that people can listen to you um or or maybe oh, yeah. buy some books from you or or etc maybe you can guide us where where we can find them well um i i think every now and then when i have to do my annual report of what i've done i always google myself and find things i didn't know about um but i would say that uh, there's uh, quite a few um lectures i've done and now working here with the uh, universities and Silesia. Um, I, there's a lot more recording coming out of the material I'm working with. So some of this is from courses I've taught and developed over many years. Some of it's new work that I'm experimenting with. Um, and if people are interested in finding me, um, I try to post at least one of my email addresses on the first image and the first slide. Uh, but also, I think it's so easy to find people that want to be found. And I've left enough of a data trail on uh, different academic sites like academia.edu and LinkedIn and that. Um, even Facebook, people find me in all these places and say, hey, can you come and talk? Or, hey, can you, do you want to collaborate? So I'm always open to those things. And uh, my only caveat is, although my father was Polish, um, I don't speak Polish. I'm an American kid who only learned English. So um, I have to use Google Translate if people reach out to me in other languages. But um, I'm happy to direct people towards uh, material, um, show them the, uh, more data about the projects that I, I've used in this scholarly presentation um, uh, but also uh, put people in touch with some of the other knowledge communities that are forming around some of these topics because a lot of the things that influence architecture urban design landscape are coming from other fields and architects increasingly are being challenged to interact on a more level way with people and experts outside of the discipline i actually think that's a good thing too but as a little kid growing up in chicago uh, and wanting to be an architect and then later Um, traveling the world and watching science fiction films to anticipate the future, I kind of arrived at the situation where some of those, uh, not just technologies, but some of those ideas about 
uh, more equitable societies and more diverse landscapes and environments. Um, I'm getting a little impatient at how slow some development is occurring. Uh, I still think that there's a lot of um, missed opportunities around uh, creating universal spaces, around creating a rich and diverse natural environments in different places, uh, spaces that are, are helpful, spaces that repair, spaces of care. Increasingly, they're showing up now, I think, particularly because of the pandemic as concerns, whereas before people assumed they would be happening somewhere or somehow. Um, but I always tell students, too, whenever they have a, a quirky idea, I'm like, you got to start somewhere, you know, start drawing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the faster you can draw it and capture it on paper, the sooner you can turn it into a transferable project, image, technology, or experience. Uh, but for me, there's nothing as powerful as a good idea. The second most powerful thing is having a really um, impress in, imprinting experience. So for me, it's always been concepts first, experiences second. But I know a lot of designers work with other value systems where the experience might be more important or uh, even the uh, universal application of things might be more important. But for me, it's always been concept and experience and trying to make those the same thing as the challenge for architectural theory in particular, but also designing using um, higher order cognitive processes. So it's not simply merchandising or real estate, but that architecture and designed environments have something more to contribute to people. So um, lifelong challenge to find better ways to explain that and to show good examples. So uh, anyone else wants to uh, share those ideas or has uh, insights? Also working with uh, my colleagues, um, there's uh, uh, annual conferences for the uh, on, on architecture, heritage, um, cognition, um, the SAUL conferences. We just had one in October, and I think there's another one coming up in September. So if they go through either the two universities I'm working with in Silesia, uh, that's probably a good place for people who are curious to start to contribute questions and insights because um, they're the ones that found me and asked me to come and talk some of these things. So I'm happy to plug my sponsors. Um, you know, the uh, Metropole Organization in the city has funded this to allow me to share my ideas with as many people as possible. Um, and people are a bit shy to speak English with me sometimes, but they always send really good questions and messages too. So uh, increasingly in the world, uh, I think it's easier for us to find other people who um, have something to contribute to these conversations, part particularly if they're around being fair and involved with uh, questions of uh, wider social groups. Um, so I think that's where a lot of the uh, dynamics are happening in terms of rethinking the function of everything from technology to theory, not simply, you know, what is the cheapest or, or you know, what is the most effective, um, but what is the most ethical and what is the most just is now filtering into conversations that wasn't happening a year ago, at least I've noticed. So I'm pretty happy about that, that transformation that's starting to happen too. I think we need to have those conversations, having um, drawings and having film stills and animations around them too, though. not simply being words, but moving towards materialization. And with that, my voice is going and I've run out of tea, so I'm going to um, bring it to a close. And uh, like I said, I'm welcome to have more conversations and point people in other directions. And I'm happy for people to you know, send in a message and correct something if they don't think I've said something accurate or correct. Um, happy to receive any sort of feedback. But thank you for the opportunity. You've done a good job of hosting this too. No problem. Happy to have you. Yeah. Uh, and have a nice holidays, nice uh, time off and to recover your voice and uh, to have uh, more energy to prepare some next uh, lectures or research. So, yes, uh, and I'll be working I'll be working with some colleagues uh, uh, up to the Christmas break, and then I, I will also be collaborating, I think, with people after the New Year starts uh, around exam time too. So I've got some more things to do with people, but it might get a little quiet around Christmas time on both sides. And I hope everyone stays healthy. Um, during the break, because we want to see what the next year brings us. It's got to be better than this year. Yep. And with, and with that, that, I'll uh, say Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Okay, take, uh, take care. Bye bye. Okay, so uh, thank you everybody for uh, tuning in and listening to. Uh, 
this lecture. Uh, something froze, I think, but uh, probably Thomas is already uh, gone. And so it was the third uh, lecture with Thomas Miko and the final one. Uh, this was about ultra thin surfaces, so hope you will would like it. And there was there were also two other ones. For example, the first one was about how features of dystopia in architecture. Second was about uh, ultra, no, sorry, about multi-purpose projects. So you can listen to on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, for example. Uh, I'm sorry you haven't seen the uh, last question, uh, but uh, probably uh, are you listening? And uh, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. We have more to come. Other lectures probably in Polish, but you, uh, you might be interested. Some, some of them will be maybe in English, so who knows? I will say also to people in Polish. Dziękuję wszystkim za oglądanie tego wykładu z Tomasem Mikalem. Zapraszam do słuchania również tych wykładów na YouTubie, grupa Interfaces. Jesteśmy też na Instagramie, jesteśmy na LinkedIn, też jesteśmy na Facebooku, jesteśmy na Spotify, jesteśmy na Apple Podcasts, na innych podcasts. Grupa interfaces.pl też możecie nas znaleźć. No i e, zapraszamy do subskrybowania. E, może Wam się spodają kolejne wykłady. Mamy też bardzo dużo zeszłych wykładów, które można sobie słuchać, zarówno jeżdżając na rowerze, jak i biegając, jak i e, robiąc sobie obiad w domu. Także albo pracując na komputerze, tak, na przykład możemy sobie słuchać albo oglądać. Także dziękuję Wam za słuchanie i oglądanie i do zobaczenia następnym razem. Śledźcie nas. Pozdrawiam serdecznie tutaj Tomek Szuliński. Miłego, miłego popołudnia. Pozdrawiam serdecznie. Ja już, ja już tutaj kończę. Ja już tutaj powoli kończę. Dajcie mi sekundkę.